<laughs> Boss Ross 33 has said, would love Shane's thoughts on the Revolution group in WCW and how it came about. I remember watching the Revolution faction and off the top of my head, you guys were never really mixed up with many people in the main event. Uh, Revolution, uh, how did it actually start? We know how it ended, but how did it come about? So when, when we had gone, and it's funny you ask that because I was just asked this question yesterday from a lawyer friend of mine. He's mm -hmm. gone back and started watching ECW from the beginning and binge watched from beginning to end. He's now on WCW, and he threw the question at me. Whose idea was it to put the triple threat back together in WCW? And I was sitting in my car at the coffee shop, and I thought, like, I actually I had to Google it. Like, well, you know, I didn't remember us being together. We were, but they didn't call us Triple Threat in typical WCW. Why would you want to do that that millions of people know? Oh, before I forget, um, before I'm sorry to interrupt, Shane, but uh, we actually found out, or I actually found out, that you, Chris Candido, and Bam Bam Bigelow wrestled one match as a trio in WCW. I just wanted to let you not, know that, so it yeah. did actually happen. Because we were arguing about this triple last threat. Month. No, you weren't called the Triple Threat. Of course you weren't. Yes. Why would you be? <laughs> but uh, yes, I'm sorry. I, I do reality. I carry on. No, I'm glad. I'm glad you threw that in because I wasn't sure if it was. I, I just when I pulled it up and I and saw it, I was like completely gone from my memory. Like no recollection of that at all. Then I, as I like was reading it and stuff, like, and it starts creeping back in a little bit. Again, as I was looking around the dressing room there, uh, I obviously had an affinity. For all these guys, Chris, Bam Bam, Dean, Chris Benoit, we had done stuff together. We've been friends. We traveled together. We had worked together. Uh, and, you know, when you work with people that you enjoy working with, makes this business a whole lot funner and, and, and more manageable. When, when you're with somebody you don't like, it's it's drudgery to go on the road. It really is a, a, a just drudgery. And uh, but as I was looking around, like there was, there was always this overcast Paul of the four horsemen over WCW, whether they were together or not at that moment, but there was always this Paul. And I thought WCW needs something to not to erase that or you know, it's the four horsemen, the most iconic uh, stable of all time, but they need something now to transcend this millionaire club and uh, new blood and, you know, to, to, to get this to a head and push it into a certain direction. And I, I, I strongly believe then, and I still believe in hindsight that it was time to move beyond, not that you're firing flair or Hogan or just putting them out the pasture. They should have become the elder statesman, <clears throat> excuse me, in our dressing room. And they're always going to be Hulk Hogan. They're always going to be Ric Flair. They're always going to be whoever. Uh, but by this time it was time to move on. And I, it was my initial inclination to either reassemble that and then Vince Russo came up with the idea to for the four to to make it different because there was some less than palatable idea to mimic ECW and uh you know and Perry being there you know Perry I was a huge fan of Perry's work and Perry you know it's a you know Perry was a good guy to hang out with and so uh he came up with the idea of the revolution he he so being Perry he, no, no, Dean, uh, 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 Vince, Vince Russo. I'm sorry. Carry yes. On. Yeah. So yeah, he, uh, I, we were, I forget what building it was. We were in the commissary in the, in the calf and, uh, he came in when you go back to that time. And I think a lot of times since when you hear Vince Russo say my boys, uh, or my guys, he's talking about me, Dean, Chris and Perry, um, pulled us together. And, you know, gave us the idea. I don't recall if he had the name Revolution, but he, he certainly came up with the idea of putting the four of us together. And I had been thinking about it and pushing the idea for the triple threat to be put back together, whether it was me, Chris, and Bammer. Excuse me, which I don't think the three of us were all there at the same time, except for that, like, one, like a brief moment that Chris came in, Bammer was there when I got there, left shortly after that. Then Chris came in like right around. There was just a brief overcross of the, of all those names, and uh, again, I don't recall if Russo came up with the idea for the the name the Revolution, but I do recall the night in uh, uh, Michigan uh, at the Palace, the Auburn Hills Palace, when they had us go to the ring and feign that we were going to burn the American flag, which of course we would have never been able to do after the nine eleven. Um, 
through that, they they had Jim uh, uh, Duggan come down. We got heat on him with a rubber board of all things. Mm-hmm. Oh, Jesus. And uh, and then Brett came down. And that was sort of setting up for Chris and Brett to have their matches. And, uh, you know, as being the one guy that had been, uh, you know, a top card heel, you could sense the heat in the building that night was palpable. And I said to the guys in the dressing room, like, hey, if you need to go to the store, don't go alone. Like if we're going to the bar, or the store, or whatever, we, we need to stick together because if we separate out, the wolf pack will get us. And uh, it was that kind of heat. And when we came back, the first reaction that I got backstage was J.J. Dillon. He goes, that was fucking disgusting. And I said, well, you should have said something in the booking meeting. Um, but it, it was major heat in the building, and it would have been money-drawing heat if, capital letters, if WCW – had fostered it properly, had gotten it over properly, had put the right heat on it. Um, the fact that WCW's low-hanging fruit was for us to threaten to burn the American flag. Uh, and then to save a Canadian out, to save it from a Canadian. <laughs> seemed like just sort of hodgepodge all over the place, right? And, uh, you know, but the heat was there. I, you know, I, if you watch me in the ring at that time, I am constantly gauging like I was taught sight and sound you're listening first and then looking second to verify what it is you're hearing. And the heat in the building that night was money drawing. heat. was the kind of heat that people would have paid to see us get our asses kicked. And they would very shortly after that, I don't know if they got scared. I don't know if they politics played into it, but right after that, it sort of started being like, like the idea of maneuvering into, uh, uh, Perry being in a dress and, you know, it was just all this, like all over the, like somebody would come over the night and go, Hey, let's do it to these guys. Or let's do, it. you know, me and the Viagra on a pool match and, and just stuff like that. That to me was like, yeah, cheesy. Right. And not heat cheesy. Oh, goodness me. We're going to be getting to that at some point. <laughs> Further on down the line of the podcast, we're going to pick some, it's, some a, it's a really stiff subject. I tell you, it's, yeah, uh... no, yeah. it's, it's, it's going to be hard to talk about Shane. Let me tell you. <laughs> um, so I'd actually started writing, reading out my own notes actually after this question. Uh, I remember the revolution for one lasting longer than it did. It really was only a few months, I think, but yeah. you weren't really mixed up with any of the top guys. You were just saying before, Hey, we need to be moving Rick and Hogan and, you know, into like legacy uh, positions. Yes. And, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. The only real main event venters that you seem to be mixed up with was Kurt Hennig. And maybe Flair at some point, I don't know. But the only other thing is, is that like we've got you in the revolution. Mm-hmm. And what's your greatest asset as a wrestler? Your promos. Promo, yeah. Exactly. So, who better to do all the promos and talking for the revolution than Dean Malenko? Why was it Dean who always seemed to be doing the speaking for the group at some point? No, I, I, I don't recall that. Uh, they would, uh, they wanted us to start the promo backstage and carry that to the ring. Mm. Uh, I don't know to abbreviate time or you know, just to make it different. Uh, but the one night little side comic to that is, uh, I would sit, you know, I would start it off in the back and as we're walking through them, would hand the mic over. And I think they wanted to sort of spread it out. Uh, so it wasn't just a flair talking for four horsemen, like the horsemen did like, like flair mm-hmm. would do the majority. Right. But then Tully would say his matter of fact piece. And then arm would give you the look over the glasses and give you his blah, 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 raise his voice a hair. They were four very different styles. Uh, my guess is it's probably more that than anything that they didn't want to just be, you know, one, one specific, uh, flavor. Um, but we, how that would, you know, blur in like one town to the next. We were backstage, I forget where, the night before we were in Chicago. And so I grabbed the mic, they hit our music, and I, hey, Chicago. And Dean Lincoln right around me said, he turned around and said, it's Columbus, you dumb shit. <laughs> you know, something like that. And I, I looked at him like, I was like, hey, they, they piped that in. I didn't say that. It was, <laughs> you, you just started losing sight of where you were. But I, I do think that it was uh, uh, probably, uh, I should say, no. I think it was probably that they wanted to have more of that horseman flavor. Cause if you remember that, that like in this time frame, there was the new horseman and then there was this, and then there was the old horseman were back and then they were gone. And then yeah, it was just this sort of trying to figure a way to re enter that, you know, to, to reintroduce that. And, uh, 
I think the major problem for us was that we, on that booking committee, none of us had any allies on the booking committee, which, you know, should have been the, whoever the boss was at that time stepping in. Cause there was a lot of money being paid out for the four of us uh, to recoup investment. But uh, it, it was clear, like, you know, within short or well, help within a, a few weeks or a month or so we were all sent home. Um, uh, you know, after we had made, you know, our, our voice is clear to, uh, to uh, was it, I always forget Bill Banks or Bill Bush, Bill the Bill that was in charge. Mm -hmm. uh, we made it clear to him that you know, look, there's obvious heat between Benoit and Kevin for obvious reasons, and there's obvious heat between me and Flair, and there's there there was all this crossing heat that you know was was always nipping at at this situation, what whatever situation the, any of us were in, and ultimately that. Uh, flushed WCW's uh, and Time Warner then their investment in the four of us, which is a pretty out, pretty big outlay of you know a couple million bucks per year for the four of us, and you know weren't recouping it. Ironically, uh, the answer from the people that were doing that was to put us on camera. You know, so like we get rid of these guys and we'll go out there and we'll become that. The only time that I remember in that whole time frame of me having any kind of main event caliber matches was the match in Kansas city with flair a month after uh, Owen had fallen to his death. And if you remember that match, there was this cavalcade of, you know, people being involved first David and then Vince Russo and then staying. And there was all this, this other stuff that so detracted from the match, uh, that, uh, in hindsight, I would learn that, that flair had derailed it with politics. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and what again a detriment like the, the Time Warner was stupid enough to li listen to that. Uh, you know, it, for whatever his reasoning, it's uh, you know, we'd all love to be able to say, man, I could be Shane Douglas of 1995, six and seven. I can't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a hair older and and a lot achier. Um, you know, and and certainly aware of what I'm capable of in the ring and not capable of. These guys, I, I would argue, far outstayed their welcome, far past their shelf life, and did detriment to their own legacies uh, in, in doing so. Um, and at this time, it, 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 again, like if you look at the fact that Ivy League uh, management schools, MBA courses, were being taught on what not to do in management on WCW, mm -hmm. I think is the epitaph that really underscores all that was wrong in WCW at the time.